Hello, and welcome to C++ Weekly. I'm your host, Jason Turner. I'm available for code reviews, contracting, and on-site training. In this episode, I wanted to make a review of Borland C++ for OS2. This seemed like a great opportunity to look at a 32-bit compiler on an old 32-bit platform. And this is, this is actually a quite old compiler. It is from a 1994, which is a couple of years before I ever touched C++ personally myself. And it's actually a pretty good tool, but like most things that I end up looking at with C++, it devolves into a question of best practices. So I'm not going to bore you with the process of getting OS2 with Borland Turbo C++, or I think it's just called Borland C++, installed on this particular platform, but I will show you what the end result was. So this is the general look and feel here. I've got Borland C++, I've got the disassembly for my current debug session open, and I've got my build window and the source editor window. Now, let's go ahead and look at this copyright information real quick. So as I said, it's from 1994. This is Borland C++ for OS2. And um, so that puts it pre-standardization. C++ 98 was the first standard of uh, C++. That was the, the first official C++ standard, that is. And so I've uh, just gone ahead and included some header files here now. Since this is pre-standard C++, we don't have namespaces, and we still have header file extensions on our header file includes here. So this is iostream.h instead of just iostream as it would be in modern C++. Oops. And control Z is not undo on this particular tool. I realized I did not spend very much time using Borland C++ or um, OS2 back in the day. And it seems that alt backspace is what we want for undo. So alt backspace. There we go. Alt backspace gets us there. So this is a relatively modern feeling editor and debugger. We've got disassembly. We've got the ability to set breakpoints. We can uh, step into the debugger and we can hop over things and whatever. Now, as you can see here, so we're just stepping into main and we see it setting up the stack push EBP. And this is going to look an awful lot like the code that you would look at Compiler Explorer today. The main difference being that this is not very, um, uh, the optimizer is not outstanding. But I wanted to go ahead and play with this, and I thought, well, you know, the, the first thing that I always do is I want to see what kind of return value optimization and object lifetime things very old C++ compilers do. Now, we're talking about a compiler at this point that is 25 years old. And I still get into arguments with people with the best way to return values from functions, and it's kind of tiring at this point. So let's just go ahead and look at this. I've got, I'm going to call this get object function right here. And all get object does is it returns an object from a function. And then what appears to be an assignment statement down here um, is an object initialization. And uh, I'm just going to go ahead and run this code. Now, if I run it from inside the disassembler, unfortunately, or inside of the debugger here, I don't see the output, and I cannot find a way to actually show the output. Now, I can run this as a full screen DOS program instead, and this is one of the beautiful things about um, OS2 is that it's got full DOS support and OS2 support, and you can do Windows like things with that. But I just went ahead and built it here with the GUI. And then I have my OS2 output window here. It looks an awful lot like a DOS prompt, but it's not quite the same. It's got quite a bit of other things going on here. And also the close buttons and maximize buttons are not where we expect them to be. So I'm going to go ahead and run this. And no, I didn't recompile it first. So you can see some of my previous examples up there. 
I'm going to compile, build all. Now, uh, another thing that's interesting to me is I have not gone through the process of actually creating a project. I'm just working on like the global settings and I've gone in here and I've set optimizations and whatever. Now, interestingly, also the global settings box or the project settings box here doesn't seem to actually have a button to close it. So you have to know that you can double click here and close it just like you would have in Windows back in the day. So I'm calling get object and I'm assigning it to the local object and I just recompiled and now I'm going to run this and I see that I get exactly one object created and one object destroyed. Those two right here. I don't have any other objects being created. I am creating an object here and get object and it is of type object which shows us our constructor and destructor calls and I've got my assignment operator and copy constructor. So if I change this to call get other object and run this. Now I still see a call to get other object and a call to get object and a call to the object constructor and the object destructor. It's still only ever created one object on the stack. And if I do this and say that I want to explicitly make some sort of copy of this object or something a couple of times over, we should begin to expect the exact same thing to happen. So I'm going to do build all and execute it again. And I do actually see copy construction here. Now, as of at least C++ 11, there is actually a special rule here saying that if you were to construct an object by calling the constr uh, co uh, copy constructor multiple times like this, and the object of the exact same type, then that is guaranteed required by the standard to be just initialization of one object. So that's not something that this compiler is able to do. So let's go ahead and take that back out if I can remember my undo command. There we go, alt backspace will get us to it. One character at a time. Probably would have been faster to just edit that by hand. Okay, so we see that we can call get other object, which calls object, which calls an object. Now let's look into our named return value optimization. And I'm going to call get local object. Get local object is going to create a local object from this get other object function and that is going to return the object. And so here we actually do see an object being constructed and then a copy constructor occurring when this value is returned from the function. That's less than ideal, but of course we have an obvious solution to that. We just return the object without giving it a name. So if I were to go ahead and create another function that's like get object choice, So now, if we're paying attention, we should expect that we're going to see object one constructed, that's one constructor, then object two constructed, that's the second constructor, and then we will see a copy constructor for one of these two objects and then a destructor. So I'm expecting to see two destructors, one copy constructor, and no, three destructors, one copy constructor, two default constructors. Ah, this is an old, old compiler. I don't have bool. I don't have... okay. Um, sure. Let's do something like that. going to say it would be funny if I had false also. All right. 
This, by the way, is with all optimizations turned on in this compiler, but in my experimentation, it didn't make any difference at all. So I get the two default constructors, the one copy constructor, and the three destructors. Now, this is mostly true with any modern C++ compiler today. As of C++ 11, we would be required to see two constructors, one move constructor, and three destructors. This uh, return would be an implicit move as of C++ 11. So now the point that I am driving at here is our best practices haven't changed at all. Not in 25 years when it comes to this kind of thinking about object lifetime kind of thing. Our obvious answer, the thing that's going to give us the best use of our resources regardless of the compiler version that we're using is multiple return paths and multiple flows through this function. Now I haven't tested this. So if this doesn't turn out like I expect it to, then, um, well, I'll be a little disappointed. But in this case, I should expect to see exactly one object constructed and exactly one object destructed, because we're going to get this return value optimization that really just comes down to the way that compilers and calling conventions are designed. So let's do this. Let's compile this, build all, cross our fingers, hope that it prints what I want it to print, and it did. I call get object, I get exactly one object constructed and exactly one object destructed, and if I change this to one to go through the other code path, then I get the two function calls, but still exactly one object constructed and one object destructed. So uh, there you have it. 25 years, our best practices, for how to efficiently return values from functions really has never changed. And this is something that I have mentioned in many, many conference talks that I've given. So uh, be sure to check out those conference talks. I've got another playlist with every conference talk I've ever given that was successfully recorded online there. So I hope you enjoyed this little uh, foray into Borland C++ for OS2. I really didn't actually show that much about the IDE, but just tried to demonstrate that things really haven't changed a whole lot if we're thinking about what has to happen when we execute our code.